Well, I was going to start the show, but I, I believe I'm retiring. I just got an email from someone claiming to be from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and they would like to park money in my bank account if I would just send them the account number. I, I just got this email. Fascinating. They're using me as a conduit for their COVID-19 funding. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here at the Eric Erickson Show. Sorry about uh, sticking with the best of yesterday. Man, I, I, I got some. Well, Sunday night was rough, let's just say. Uh, I was worried I wasn't going to have a voice today. But I do, so I'm here. And there is news, news you can use, important news. Stacey Abrams, she's been so busy campaigning to be vice president of the United States that she forgot to do one big important thing. She never actually endorsed Joe Biden. No, I'm not making that. I saw this headline today, and I thought, you mean she hadn't done it already? Nope, she hadn't done it already. Headline from the Politico. Stacey Abrams uh, endorses Biden. Uh, The former Georgia gubernatorial candidate becomes the latest potential vice presidential pick to back the presumptive Democratic nominee. What do you mean she hasn't done this before now? Stacey Abrams, the former Democratic nominee for governor in Georgia, on Tuesday. Wait, on Tuesday? What? You mean, wait, she's doing it this morning? I'm confused. She endorsed former Vice President Joe Biden's White House bid. Vice President Biden is the leader America needs, a leader who will restore dignity, competence, and compassion to the Oval Office while restoring America's moral leadership of the world. She said in a statement distributed by the Biden campaign. In other words, uh, the statement was prepared and vetted and released and an embargo to this morning. So the headline is out this morning, but the, the practical effect of this is that it, it didn't happen until this morning. So Abrams, Abr- wait, 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 it, it, political. Abrams' statement Tuesday represents another high-profile endorsement of Biden from one of his prospective vice presidential picks. So she's not even the first. Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar, Elizabeth Warren, Gretchen Whitmer, all top candidates to become his running mate, have similarly thrown their support. Uh, But among the field of female Democratic candidates likely to take the number two spot, Abrams has most aggressively lobbied for the role, publicly promoting herself for the job and arguing she would make an excellent choice. Biden's campaign has tired of Abrams' antics. As a result of this, uh, they they want nothing to do with her. They believe her campaign for vice president is getting more exposure than Joe Biden's campaign for president, and they don't like it. They want her to cut it out. This is just amazing, though. She's been campaigning for vice president for so many weeks, and she forgot to even endorse the guy. (laughs) That just, wow. But talk about putting the cart before the horse. Oh, my goodness gracious. This is kind of embarrassing. You know, so I had a call. I, I write uh, two newspaper columns a week. One is a syndicated column. You should tell your local newspaper to carry my syndicated column from Creator Syndicate. And then I do another column in the Macon Telegraph where I live. And the one in the Macon Telegraph was on this Stacey Abrams situation. And, and I, I don't need to rehash it because it was basically uh, my monologue from last week on, on she needs to remember Shakespeare in Love, the, the Miramax campaign so hard for that movie to beat Saving Private Ryan. It did. And ever after, movies have been punished for openly campaigning for Best Picture. And she's been openly campaigning for vice president in a way that struck so many as seemly, uh, unseemly. And in fact, she's gotten more attention for a vice presidential bid than Biden's gotten for his presidential bid. And it's hurting her. She needs to so, show some level of humility. And don't tell me she's not capable of it. I actually have interviewed Stacey Abrams before. She was one of the best interviews I have ever conducted. I have interviewed world leaders And Stacey Abrams was self-deprecating. She was funny. Uh, She showed levels of humility in the things she didn't understand. She was willing to admit. I appreciated that. And she needs to do that now. But, man, she is not. Um, (laughs) um, So, all right, that's all we need to say about that. There's there's no reason to to turn this into an entire, uh, entire half of the show. But, yeah, she totally forgot to endorse Biden, and today she is. Uh, before I go on, I, there were emails from people who were very upset I wasn't here yesterday, wanted to know if I got my smoke. I have not gotten my smoker. 
I went out and I loaded up on Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce, which is kind of funny uh, because it, they are sponsoring the show. And I intend to, like, take pictures of me cooking with Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce because we actually use it in our house. And none of you actually believe me. Uh, so I'm going to put it on Instagram. You should follow me there. Uh, and you sh- could, should go get Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce yourself in any event. Um, but I didn't get my smoker. And Roland Neal, who, who is the, the owner of Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce, he texted me yesterday and said, don't forget to mention Mrs. Griffin's. And did you get your smoker? No, I didn't get my smoker, and I've been up all night puking my guts up, so I wasn't on radio yesterday. So I'm killing all birds with one stone this morning and, and making it happen. Oh, yesterday was rough. But um, I, I intend to put up pictures of my uh, Rectech uh, pellet grill when I get it. And, you know, the sad thing is all these people who are – I'm reading all these cookbooks, and they make disparaging comments on the pellet grill. And I get it. I, I, I kind of like controlling the fire and stuff in my big green egg, but I've done it. I've done it for more than a decade. Now I want something that I can set it and forget it. I want to sleep at night say, uh, staying up with my brisket. So it'll be here tomorrow. We need to move on to something that I have uh, talked about multiple times and it, it, it comes to the foreground now again with the Ahmad Arbery situation. Mr. Arbery was gunned down in Brunswick and it has become quite a national issue and I would submit to you that it never should have been a national issue in large part because Uh, A a mother whose child is gunned down in the street should not have to go to the national press to gain outrage to seek justice for her son. And Mr. Arbery's mother did. I am a conservative. I I am in the conservative movement. I I have had profiles written of me as as one of the influential conservatives in this country. Uh, I I have uh, candidates running for president who call in 2024, no less, already calling. Uh, I, I have had, you, you know, it, one of the, the, the untold stories of the 2016 campaign is uh, the vice president flying into Macon to campaign and, and setting aside an hour to sit down and meet with me to try to persuade me to get on board the, the, the Trump-Pence campaign. Uh, the vice president has been a dear friend for more than a decade. I've got actually got a book. I can see it from my vantage point right now uh, that he gave me when I first got started in politics, Russell Kirk's conservative mind with a great inscription on the inside of it that if you're going to be in the conservative movement, you might as know you might as well learn what conservatism really stands for. And I, I believe that conservatism does actually stand for stuff. And, and there's this trite little statement that I hear the growing populist nationalist movement make: "What does conservatism ever conserve? It, it has conserved your ability to stand in the public square and defend your positions." It has defended a culture of life and advanced a culture of life in this country. It has defended you being able to homeschool your kids in this country. The conservative movement has done a great deal in this country. Conservative movement does not mean that you're fixed in time, uh, but it means we slow down the advance of the state to figure out whether or not it's the right way to go. And the people who say what has conservatism ever conserved are people who claim to have been in the conservative movement but never bothered to figure out what it meant to be a conservative other than uh, throw bombs at the left. And those of us who are in the conservative movement should be a little concerned with the fact that there are people out there who claim to be conservative who have become truthers at war with the truth. The COVID-19 truthers who are convinced it's no big deal, it's just like the flu, pay no attention to the numbers, the numbers are all wrong, everything is rigged. Everything you want to believe, you go find. Like the people who are going for that pandemic video or, or the Bill Gates truthers. I haven't spent a lot of time on Bill Gates, but I'm starting to get emails from listeners asking me what I think on this, which tells me that it is is creeping in on social media the Bill Gates conspiracy theories, they're all crap, by the way. Um, yeah, I'm not a big Bill Gates fan. I'm an i am an Apple guy. I'm not a Windows guy. Bill Gates, I think, largely got inspired to, to steal Windows from Apple. I don't think that's really a dispute. He just coded it differently so he could get away with it, which was smart on his part. Uh, but the man actually is a brilliant leader who has made billions of dollars several times over uh, making uh, personal computers a thing. And I do not believe he is looking to gain billions of dollars by making a COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, he's going through his nonprofit foundation, which would not make a profit on this stuff. Uh, he is doing it for the common good. And you all are so, I shouldn't say you all, some of you are so suspicious of people doing things for the common good these days. Uh, you're, you're willing and able to latch on to sinister motives where there are none. Uh, Bill Gates is not a sinister person. He did not manufacture COVID-19 to get rich off of people. He's not trying to manufacture a vaccine to get rich off people. He's got enough money. 
Bill Gates can't spend all of his money right now. Bill Gates is is deeply, deeply concerned with public health the world over. He's been for years trying to battle malaria and come up with ways to treat malaria. This virus is something he's been warning about a global pandemic for years, and now suddenly it's here. And so he's mobilizing his resources to fight it. And, and what's the thanks? You got a bunch of people out there spreading conspiracy theories about him that he's intentionally infecting people on behalf of China to get wealthy, which is nuts. When you want to believe the worst about something, you, you always, guess what, find up, wind up believing the worst about the person. There's no reason to believe the worst about Bill Gates. There's no reason to believe the lies about COVID-19. It actually is bad. A lot of people actually are dying. More than half of them are in nursing homes, which suggests we need to find a path forward that involves protecting uh, the elderly in our population. But there's no reason to be a truther on this stuff. And now it is not a coincidence. I don't think that some of the very same people who are spreading COVID-19 lies are also spreading lies about Ahmad Arbery. It is striking to me uh, that you have a situation of a of a black victim, two white men who killed him, and you've got usual suspects out there uh, trying to make this all about race, not from the left, not from the black community, but from the white community. Oh, the, the, they're out to get the white guys. They're, they're always wanting to blame the white. You know, sometimes the white guys deserve the blame. It is striking to me. To see a number of people out there who should know better, who are trying to say, well, you know, I'm an Arbery. He wasn't a good guy. Do you know, let, let, let's accept these things you just, just for the sake of argument. Let's accept they're true. It, it appears that Gregory McMichael, who shot and killed uh, Mr. Arbery, who was the investigator, actually had a run in with Mr. Arbery in 2018, uh, where Arbery was arrested and his probation for something was revoked. It appears that he might have been involved in a burglary. It, it appears, maybe, for the sake of argument, say he was. Doesn't matter. Gregory McMichael had no business following Mr. Arbery, blocking his path, brandishing a weapon, and saying he was going to enact a citizen's arrest on him. It doesn't matter if, if Ahmad Arbery was in a construction site. The homeowner of that construction site tells ABC News nothing was stolen. There was no police report filed. It was no big deal. People have been going in to check out his home that he's building. There was another video circulated that purported to show Ahmad Arbery uh, at a residence on multiple occasions at night prowling about. Uh, Mr. Arbery's family and now others have come forward and said that wasn't him. Even if it was him, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He should still be alive had Gregory McMichael restrained himself and decided not to be a cop, which he's not. He's an investigator for district attorney. Arbery would still be alive. I, I see no reason anyone needs to slander Ahmad Arbery other than to try to discredit him and to defend the people who killed him. I saw someone on my, my face, uh, Facebook page last night um, saying, well, I, I'm going to withhold judgment. I'm going to withhold judgment. I can't believe you're rushing to – what the hell do you have to rush to – the guy is dead. There's no the, the rush to judgment happened by the two people who killed him. All of these people, and you know, they wouldn't be doing that. The, the people are saying, I'm, I'm going to hold my finger. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to rush to judgment on this. I, I don't know what happened. I bet they wouldn't be doing that if, if it were the roles were reversed and the races were reversed. Conservatives need to do a better job of calling out the truthers in their midst. Uh, you, you know, I say all the time that most of the conservative movement is is premised in Judeo-Christianity where there is an absolute truth. And, and we got a bunch of people who want to be Pontius Pilate now within the conservative movement. So what, what is true? What, what, what is this true thing you're talking about? What's true for you may not be true for me. No, there actually is truth. We got an obligation to it. And so we got an obligation to call out the people on our side who are, are spreading lies and innuendo and trying to discredit a dead man uh, so that they could justify murder. And that's exactly what they're doing. They don't want to admit it, but that's what they're doing. They're trying to justify a murder. And we should call them out on that. A, a man is dead, and he's dead because two people decided to take the law into their own hands. They had no business doing so. It does not matter whether Mr. Aubrey was a saint or not. 
he should still be alive. And frankly, uh, there are a number of people on the conservative side who right now are more invested in the narrative that Ahmad Arbery wasn't a saint than in the fact that his lack of sainthood does not mean he deserved to die. He was not charged with a crime. He was not arrested by law enforcement. He was hunted down, his path blocked, and he struggled. And he had every right to struggle, just as you would have a right to struggle if someone pulled a gun on you. But the odds are that if you're white, it wouldn't have happened to you. And if it had happened to you, there would have been an arrest, and there wasn't. It should bother everyone that his family had to go to a national media to get attention for justice to be done. So there was a bunch of hullabaloo yesterday that Mitch McConnell had COVID-19, that he tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, it turns out it was a uh, female comedian, a, a comedian who thought it would be funny to tweet out that he had COVID-19 uh, because she's upset with his policies. Uh, she, she ultimately wound up deleting the tweet. But, yeah, you know, it, it's funny because Mitch McConnell is is on the wrong side and therefore – uh, it's okay to say that he had COVID-19. Um, just, just, it's amazing to watch people on the left really, really root against, uh, conservatives root against the, the, the hair salon owner in Dallas, Texas, uh, who they've got no relation to these people. They've got no connection to these people, no ties to these people. And, and so they can tell jokes about them and, and they can mock their misfortune when it comes to the virus. Uh, listen, I, I'm in the, um, I, I, I'm in the, it's time to reopen camp. And I'm also in the, it is time to get serious and, and stop peddling nonsense about the virus camp. It is possible to be in both camps. It is possible to decide that the virus is bad and a big deal and also that we need to find a way to reopen it, it, this idea. So Anthony Fauci is going to testify before Congress today. And in his testimony before Congress, Fauci is going to say that there will be needless deaths by this rush to reopen. And I understand what he's saying. As someone who treats the virus seriously, who is worried about the viral spread, who is worried about a rebound, we're seeing rebounds in, in different parts of the world, and we're going to have to do a better job of containing it here when it does rebound. But it is going to rebound because there is no cure, and we have no immunity to it. Now, listen, I, 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 I've I, got friends of mine who advocate the whole herd immunity thing, uh, but you got to get 80% of the country infected to have herd immunity, and that's going to kill a lot of people. And, and it's going to fill up a lot of hospitals. But the idea that we've got to wait at this point, particularly when, when Fauci's own data acknowledges that uh, hotter, warmer, more humid weather is going to to help. There's, by the way, there's good news here in Georgia. Speaking of, I don't know where the hot weather is in Georgia, by the way. This is so weird. I mean, it's been pleasant. We've been sleeping with the windows open at our house because it's so cool at night. And in fact, I had to, the last couple of nights in a row, had to put on an extra blanket because the house got so cold at night. It was great. Man, I don't know about you guys up in North Georgia. It, it's got to be super pleasant up there if downright chilly. You're you're almost to summer and, and it's cold out, which is fine with me. So where where is the summer heat and humidity that's going to help us? But eventually it will come. And when it comes, you will all forget, uh, as you are ser serenaded by media saying global warming because it's so hot outside, you'll all forget just how mild May was. But that hot weather and humidity will help with the virus, will, will help mitigate the virus. And we need to figure out a way to reopen. The idea that we can stay home forever is preposterous to me. People need to work. It's good for your soul to work. And it also generates income for you. Uh, eventually, the government, we're going to see out of control inflation and all sorts of financial repercussions if the government continues to do what it's doing. It's not a good setup for us to stay home. we got to find a path forward. And Fauci, listen, he's not wrong when he says more people are going to die by reopening uh, than if we stayed put. But there is some data out there that does suggest that stay in put. Uh, we, we still lost a lot of people, and more than half of the deaths have come from nursing homes. If we could figure out the nursing home situation, it wouldn't be as bad. It would be bad, but not as bad. But there's also the New York City situation, and everyone forgets this. I wonder how much different the coverage would be 
if the media were not all in New York City? You, you know, it's like if there's a blizzard in Montana, it doesn't get covered by the national press. But if you get three snowflakes in New York City, it becomes a breaking news item and leads the world news uh, on every network. The coronavirus situation in New York is so bad, and yet they're treating Andrew Cuomo as some sort of conquering hero, uh, when in fact it looks more and more like Andrew Cuomo completely mismanaged the situation in New York, and no one wants to call him out. They want to set him up as the good guy against Donald Trump as the bad guy, and it's really false advertising and a false narrative. You know, if I were a Republican billionaire right now, one day maybe, I can have aspirational goals, can't I? (laughs) I actually don't want a billion dollars. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind being a multi. I, I want it. There's some land near me, and I would love to to buy a lot of land. And and I have had this house in my head. I mean, literally, I've had this house built in my head since I was a kid. And I just I want to build this house. And I've added to it and, and added different things to it over the years. But by and large, the, the house has remained in design uh, the same way it always has. And I just I want to I want a lot of land and I want to build my house. And I wouldn't mind having a beach house. I wouldn't mind having a – yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't mind money. I don't have it right now. One day if this, this show takes off and, and I get – not that – I think the glory days of, of $100 million radio deals are done. But I don't need that much. Uh, but I don't want to be a billionaire. Um, I, I, I don't know a whole lot of billionaires who I, I think I'm going to see on the other side of eternity, put it to you that way. Uh, and money does something to people long term, uh, if, if they don't know how to use it, uh, in the right way. But nonetheless, um, I, I, if I were a Republican billionaire right now, I would be running ads across the country, uh, in local media, highlighting Everything the media continues to get wrong on on the COVID-19 story and and how they're not reporting stuff. So, for example, the great media freakout over Brian Kemp reopening Georgia. Uh, We're now about 14 days into this, and we're not having the massive flare-up the media said we're going to have. Now, maybe we will, but thus far we're not. Or in Florida, they reopened beaches in Florida, and they have not had this massive viral spread in Florida. Or remember Wisconsin, there's an election today in Wisconsin. People are actually going to the polls in Wisconsin today. Uh, Where is the media hysteria over spreading the virus? Remember all the media outrage over the Wisconsin viral spread from the election? And and there were certainly some pockets of it that happened, but by and large, it did not happen in the way the media claimed. I would be running these ads nonstop nationwide in local media with the tagline at the end, they don't care if they're right, they care about helping the Democrats. Because it seems more and more likely that they are. I mean, look, look at the Chuck Todd situation on, on NBC on Sunday on Meet the Press. Uh, his his team selectively edited William Barr to make it claim that William Barr uh, did not have a reason for dropping the Mike Flynn lawsuit when, in fact, they cut the clip right before William Barr explained his reasoning. And it, it blew up, and, and Chuck Todd and MSNB, or, uh, NBC have had to come out and apologize for it. That is CBS News has done something recently very much the same way. There, there have been several times where they, I mean, the media is just, they are all in on helping the Democrats right now. And they always have been, but I've never seen it as in your face as it is right now. Take, for example, the president's press conference yesterday where the president decided uh, there was a, the president, he, he wanted to go through this. Let, let, let me play the soundbite for you from his press conference before I get to that. I had an update on the unprecedented testing capacity developed by the United States, the most advanced and robust testing system anywhere in the world by far. This afternoon, I'll also announce new steps that we're taking to make tests even more widely available. To battle a virus, my administration marshaled every resource at our nation's disposal, public, private, military, economic, scientific, and industrial, all at your disposal. We launched the largest manufacturing ramp up since the Second World War. There's been nothing like it since. At the center of this industrial and scientific mobilization was the development of our coronavirus testing capabilities. In the span of just a few short months, we've developed a testing capacity unmatched and unrivaled anywhere in the world, and it's not even close. This is a core element of our plan to safely and gradually reopen America, and we're opening and we're starting, and there's enthusiasm like I haven't seen in a long time. 
Every American should be proud of the amazing array of talent, skill, and enterprise our nation has brought to this challenge. In three months, the FDA has authorized more than 92 different tests, and over 9 million have been performed here in the United States. Three weeks ago, we were conducting roughly 150,000 tests per day. Now we're doing approximately 300,000 tests per day, a 100 percent increase, and it will go up substantially from that number. So for weeks, the media has been going after the president. Uh, What about testing? What about testing? What about testing? What about testing? How good your testing? Why isn't your testing good? Well, why why do we suck, Mr. President? Why is Europe better than us? Because, you know, the media believes Europe is always better than us. Why? Why not? So here he comes and he gives the data. Uh, we're now testing more than all these other countries. We're testing more per capita. We're testing more in, in overall numbers. Uh, testing, 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 testing is good. We can reopen the country because we're meeting the testing metrics that the doctor said we needed to meet to be able to reopen the country. So he gets towards the end of the press conference, and, and this reporter, I don't know who she was, uh, but but of uh, Asian descent, says, uh, Mr. President, why are you making this a competition? Y'all. For weeks on end, the media has been attacking the president for not ramping up testing nationwide. So he ramps up testing nationwide. He has a press conference, and he says how much better we're doing than all these other countries that we were behind a couple of weeks ago. And why, why is it a competition? Why, why does it matter that we're ahead of – because you people made it. But but so he ultimately says, ask China. And the reporter says, well, wh- why are you telling me to ask China? She's an Asian-descended re- – of Asian descent. Now, the media immediately presumes the president is being racist. Here's the thing, though. Some of you will immediately presume the president is being racist. Uh, My default is not to presume the president is being racist. It is, if you will recall, a few weeks ago, there was a a female Asian reporter who happened to work for the Chinese communist regime who was asking the president uh, questions that were based on Chinese propaganda talking points. Yesterday in the Rose Garden, all of the reporters were wearing face masks. What's more likely that the president was racist? If you're a Democrat, you're going to say, yes, I I get that. But in all honesty, what's more, more likely that the president was being racist or the president got the two reporters confused, thought that the reporter asking the questions yesterday was the reporter who actually was working for the Chinese Communist News Organization. I Listen, I, I'm, your mileage can vary on this. I don't really care. But I think that the, the media immediately jumping to, oh, well, he was racist. Here's Brian Stetler on CNN. Well, clearly the president was rattled, rattled enough to walk off because he didn't want to hear the questions from Caitlin Collins and Weijia Zhang. And uh, I think what we saw in that exchange with Weijia Zhang is something that has racial overtones. Uh, it is racist to look at an Asian American White House correspondent and say, "Ask China." This isn't happening in a vacuum. This is part of a pattern of behavior from the president that goes back many years. So he's he doesn't have the benefit of the doubt that someone might have if. For the first time ever in their life, they made a comment like that to a reporter. But the president has been rattled by Weijia Zhang's questions in the past. He has treated her and other female reporters differently in the past. And he's also had this pattern of reacting to minority journalists in a very specific and different way, Wolf. For example, a few years ago, President Trump said to April Ryan, a black correspondent, uh, to follow up with the uh, Congressional Black Caucus because he kind of just assumed they were friends. And here today, he's saying to a Chinese-born journalist, ask China. Now, of course, he says he was directing it. He would have have said the same thing to anyone. But the pattern suggests otherwise. I I can't listen to him anymore. Uh, Wei Zhejing, is she the CBS reporter who claims someone uh, called the virus the Kung Flu to her and she's generated a story and won't actually name the White House personnel who said it? Is that the reporter we're talking about? Because I I honestly don't trust that reporter. Uh, And and I'll just be real honest with you. When when you go out and you you create a story, you create a story as a journalist and make it about you. Someone said Kung Flu to me, and I'm offended by it. And I'm not going to tell you who said it. That reporter already doesn't have credibility. But regardless, I I would submit to you it is actually very likely that the president of the United States confused her with the Chicom reporter. 
There actually was a female Chinese communist reporter that the White House press corps let in. Remember, uh, the White House uh, the, the White House press corps sets who gets to come ask these questions. They they give the credentials to come be a part of their little show. The White House itself does not do this. It's the press press corps. Uh, John Jonathan Carl from ABC News is is the head of it right now. Ed Henry, I think last year from Fox News was in charge of it. Uh, but it, you you got to keep that in mind, please. And they allowed a Chinese communist reporter to come ask Chinese communist propaganda based questions to the president a couple of weeks ago, and he was having none of it. And I suspect this reporter was wearing a face mask. He didn't realize that they weren't the same person, and he said, "Go ask China." That's my that is my presumption not that he was being racist to this this cbs reporter who's been nursing all sorts of uh grievances against this white house uh creating stories about herself in this white house without actually uh then and and announcing who did you know there was that scene with with kellyanne conway several weeks ago when the story blew up and they were asking kellyanne conway about it and kelly well who said it to her she she she's created the story and she won't tell us who did it the media double standard, I, you guys, I'm telling you, you could do an ad campaign and totally discredit them. I mean, they're discrediting themselves, but a lot of people aren't connecting the dots on this. Uh, the media right now is all about helping Joe Biden get elected. That's it. Uh, and they will surrender uh, everything to get Joe Biden elected. It, it is a big deal for them. All of their credibility, all of their trust. All of their uh, responsible news coverage out the window just to get Joe Biden elected. Look at how they're championing Andrew Cuomo in New York City. Uh, you would think that Andrew Cuomo was qualified for saint- sainthood and uh, five-tenths of a percent of New York City is dead from the coronavirus. I saw that statistic today, unreal. Uh, five, five-tenths, uh, 0.5% of New York City from the corona. Just uh, absurd. Absurd numbers. And uh, Andrew Cuomo completely screwed things up. He didn't shelter in place when he should have. He let things drag out. He didn't close down schools in New York City. He and the uh, mayor of New York were squabbling. The mayor's a bigger idiot than Andrew Cuomo. And the media is treating Cuomo for sainthood. Uh, Chris Cuomo, his brother, has him on CNN all the time, building him up, making him look personable, never challenging what he got wrong. They would never do that to Donald Trump. They are all in the tank for the Democrats right now. Every single one of them in the tank for the Democrats and helping build up Andrew Cuomo in New York City, ignoring the death toll in New York City. When you subtract, remember last week, last week there was the story about, you know, the nation continues to increase in COVID-19 cases if you take New York out of the equation. Actually, you take New York City out of the equation, you take New York State out of the equation, the situation in the United States is way better, way better. I mean, the United States just drops, per capita drops on every list dramatically if you take New York out of the equation. Andrew Cuomo and uh, and and Bill de Blasio screwed it up. But the media hates Donald Trump so much they will build up Andrew Cuomo as some sort of hero uh, for no other reason than they feel compelled to build him up to go after Donald Trump. Striking media bias in that regard. It is. Um, but – there's nothing you can do unless you're a Republican billionaire and want to run an ad campaign, and I think you should. Um, there, there's more. There, there's more from the White House conference I want to get to. Let, let me let me play one more clip though before we go to commercial with the president uh, on the Chinese hackers. Please there, go ahead. There are a variety of reports that Chinese hackers are attempting to steal technology related to vaccine research. Is this something you're concerned about? What What can you say? So what else is new with China? What else is new? Tell me. I'm not happy with China. They should have stopped this at the source. They could have stopped it right at the source. So now you're telling me they're hacking. So I just say this, Steve, what else is new? We're watching it very closely. uh, If I could follow up, sir, the South uh, China Morning Post, the Beijing newspaper, says that China would like to reopen negotiations on the trade deal to make the terms more favorable to them. Is this something you'd be interested in doing? Uh, No, not at all. Not even a little bit, no. I'm not interested. We signed a deal. I had heard that, too. They'd like to reopen the trade talk to make it a a better deal for them. Uh, China's been taking advantage of the United States for many, many years, for decades, because we had people at this position right here where I'm standing, sitting right in that office, the Oval Office, that allowed that to happen. No, I'm not interested in that. Let's uh, see if they live up to the deal that they signed. 
you know, he's got a point. But the media in this country is so antagonistic towards him. You know, they're they're out today claiming that China is going to retest 11 million people in Wuhan because six people have the virus. And they're just reporting it as fact. They're not even recognizing Chinese propaganda at play. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay. We need to take a commercial break. Before I do. I want to remind you guys about First Liberty Building and Loan down in Noonan. They're they're in Noonan. They're local. They're here. They're in Georgia. They're the Frost family. Uh, If you're involved in conservative politics at all, you probably know the Frost. If you need uh, PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, if you need to get into it and you haven't been able to get into it yet, there's still money in the program, and the Frost at First Liberty have been helping people get in. Uh, If you go to firstlibertyga.com, uh, the Frost can help you navigate the program. It is firstlibertyga.com is their website. And there's an apply now button. If you click the button, uh, they will be able to get you into the program. Uh, maybe. They can't guarantee it. I don't want to say they can get you in. They can't guarantee it. They've been having really good success lately. There's still money in the program. Congress is actually thinking of adding even more money to the program still. So if you haven't gotten into the payroll protection program for your small business and you want to get into it, Go to FirstLibertyGA.com, click the Apply Now button. The one thing the Frost tell me is that you do need to go on and get your paperwork in order. You've got to have your a proof of payroll. And whether it's your quarterly filings with the IRS or something else to show payroll, uh, you got to be able to get that together quickly so that they can get you into the program. Uh, but if you're interested, they can't guarantee it. They'll do their best. It is FirstLibertyGA.com is the website. You can call in. I've been bad about giving the phone number today. I wasn't here yesterday, and I had so much I wanted to catch up on, and we had the press conference. But I will take your phone calls if you want to call in. 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425 is the phone number. The phone lines actually are open uh, so, uh, very happy to have you here. If you want to be here, y'all, my gym opens next week and I am definitely going back now. I, 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 I pay extra for one-on-one, so it won't be me in a crowd there. It'll just be me and the trainer, but man, yeah. Am I the only one who sucks at working out at home? I have tried it. I, I, you know, I ordered a barbell two months ago. And there were no weights to buy. Everybody went out and bought all the weights. There are no weights. Uh, There's just the barbell. And so I ordered it and it never came. So I canceled it. And then it came and they charged me and I kept it because I'm not sending that bad boy back. Uh, But my goodness gracious, I'm I'm not good at working out at the house. So I've been going for a lot of walks, uh, having quiet time in the afternoon uh, alone, uh, having to come to terms with the fact that summer is upon us. The kids have already been home for a month and a half, although they've been working during the day. And and now what are they going to do while I'm in the house? Like this morning, I got up, got ready for the show. Uh, I was in here starting the show. I went out on commercial break uh, and everyone's still asleep. Other than my my, my son is up. He's, He's up playing a video game which we got to work on that as well. We can't have screen time all summer long. But I, I've got friends who send their kids to camp. And they're beside themselves that camp is probably going to be canceled this summer. And apparently this is a thing for some people. I just, I, I, I don't understand it. I My parents never sent me to camp. Now, granted, I grew up in Dubai, but we would come home during the summer. But I never, I never even knew camp was a thing. Until I was in college and, and people talking about they, they went to camp during the summer. They, a week or two during the summer, they would go to camp. What What, what is this? You you abandon your kids for two months. You don't see them all year long. And then during the summer, you get to see them and you get tired of them. So for two weeks, you send them to camp. Now, turns out that a lot of my friends actually loved it. Uh, great experience. We, we made friends. We learned stuff. And uh, Okay. I, I don't want to disparage people for going to camp, but I really had no idea this was a thing. And I was talking to a, a friend the other day who his kids' camp is canceled this summer. They just, they don't know what they're going to do. Having the kids home all summer long. Well, you you, you do stuff where you learn to ignore them. <laughs> I don't know. I just say, this this is a whole new phenomenon for me. All right, uh, so Brian Adams, you, you know Brian Adams, uh, summer of 69 and, and all of that. Uh, he, he went on a, a tirade about the, the, the virus. And I got to tell you, <laughs> I read it and a a buddy of mine who sent it out was right. It sounds like it sounds like it could be a tirade from a diehard Donald Trump supporter. Uh, Where where is this? Uh, 
thanks to some blankety blank bat eating wet market animal selling virus making greedy blankety blanks the whole world is now on hold not to mention the thousands that have suffered or died from this virus and then he turned that into a message on how everyone should be vegan and and stop that uh stop stop eating so it it sounded like it was a tirade from a trump supporter but then it actually turns out that he's totally a vegan and wants people to to be a vegan and now it's become all sorts of outrage he was supposed to have a um he was supposed to have a concert he was supposed to be at royal albert hall and now it's getting canceled and he went on this tirade and he really wishes that everyone would become vegan so that his virus the so that the virus would have never for my goodness gracious um people are really upset People are really, really upset. Here's one tweet I'm seeing. I'm willing to sell my Brian Adams cassette tape. I can't support him anymore. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. People are so upset with him. I didn't have Brian Adams being a screaming racist on my 2020 Stop the Madness bingo card. Says, um, up. Oh, this is a blue check mark brigade. Yes, an NBC legal contributor. Yeah, you know the, the people who are most outraged, interestingly enough, uh, are the um, are the blue check mark brigades. Uh, m- most normal people are like, yeah, okay, but nope. The blue check marks are. We can never listen to Brian Adams again. Now he must be reeducated. I want to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, uh, and that is Laurel Springs. You've probably heard of them, particularly given right now, you know, our kids uh, have very good teachers who've been hands-on with them doing Zoom calls and stuff. Uh, but man, I've got a lot of friends of mine who they're in this quarantine shelter in place situation like we've been, uh, and their schools have not really done a lot. In fact, a lot of them have changed grades to pass fail or they haven't really been engaged. And uh, friends of mine feel like their kids might be slipping behind. Well, you know, maybe, maybe. Uh, You need to consider something like Laurel Springs if you're disappointed in your school right now, or maybe just for your kids, you need to optimize your kids' routine, make it more flexible for them, more dynamic for them, so they got more time to focus on things they love. Laurel Springs is an accredited online private school for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. Laurel Springs recognizes each child as a unique individual with their own personal interests, special talents, unique learning style. Their flexible learning program offers challenges and diverse elective courses. And Laurel Springs is accredited with the Western Association of Schools and Colleges and Advanced Ed, which means they got transcripts. They're recognized by colleges and universities. If you're interested in this, you can register your child at laurelsprings.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, today and receive a waived registration fee. That's laurelsprings.com slash Eric for your waived registration fee, laurelsprings.com slash Eric. If you are interested in a new way to teach your kid, you've gotten familiar with homeschooling over the quarantine, it works, but you need something with a little more engagement and a little more flexibility, go check out Laurel Springs today at laurelsprings.com slash Eric. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia. Welcome to you. It is six after the hour. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, then the phone lines, they really are open. I really am here. I'm I'm better from my bout of food poison. Oh, it was bad, y'all. Um, <laughs> the phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Let me give you some good news. I, I, I want to spend a little more time later on this, but there's some good news out there for the state of Georgia. Uh, 262,179 tests done, uh, 34,635 cases, 1,443 ICU admissions, 6,130 hospitalizations, 1,461 deaths. Those are cumulative numbers, though, cumulative numbers. Uh, it turns out that the state uh, is actually, we've, we're on a downward trajectory in the virus. There have been so, some blips and hiccups along the way, uh, but we're doing well in terms of the viral spread. Uh, we had, for example... Um, on April 27th, 919 cases. That turns out to have been our high. Ironically, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, April 20th, 931 cases. Ironically, uh, that is when the governor said he would begin the procedure to reopen the state the next day. Uh, that was our high. On April 27th, we had 919 cases. And it's been downhill from there, a, a pretty rapid decline as testing has ramped up. So here are the data points you need to know uh, and that, that are the really good data points for the state. 
As testing has ramped up, we're, we're testing now um, orders of magnitude more people on a daily basis than we were testing uh, just a month ago. Even three weeks ago, we're testing orders of magnitude more. By the way, the governor's going to have a press conference at 4 o'clock today, uh, and we'll potentially say that uh, bars and, and nightclubs have to stay closed longer. Part of that is South Korea has been seeing a rebound among young people. Uh, and they're spreading it to older people, and it's coming from bars and nightclubs. Uh, there's a lot of global data that bars and nightclubs are breeding grounds uh, among young people who aren't taking necessary precautions. So they will stay closed. But uh, the, the virus continues to decline. The daily deaths continue to, continue to decline. The total people in the hospitals right now is good, um, and it, it's the lowest it's been. Things are looking really good. Things are looking up. And uh, there's a lot of reason for optimism. There is concern about rebound. There is concern that people are lowering their guards and in lowering their guards, um, it, there could be problems. Um, but it looks like we are on a downward trajectory uh, as as testing continues to go up. I mean, the the, the number of tests in the state is incredible, uh, and the number of confirmed infections has largely plateaued in the state, which was the whole purpose of sheltering in place. So again, for all the people blowing up the governor, it, it looks very much actually like um, like we we did the right thing, and the science was on the governor's side. But you know, he's taking a brutal, brutal hit in polling. Brian Kemp is uh, the Washington Post shows that Brian Kemp, uh, being one of the first governors in the nation to jump out and say we're going to reopen, is absolutely getting slammed in all the polling out there. Uh, He is right now one of the least popular governors in the nation, and it has everything to do with his handling of the virus. 39% of adults approve of Governor Kemp's performance, 39%, which is just incredible. Ironically, in Florida, Ron DeSantis has has not been nearly as competent as uh, Brian Kemp, and he's got a 60% approval rating. But here in Georgia, no, 39% approval rating uh, for Governor Kemp. Now, why? Well, two things. Republicans in the state of Georgia are furious with Brian Kemp for ordering shelter in place at all, and Democrats are furious with Governor Kemp for uh, getting us out of shelter in place and not doing it soon enough. Remember, the Democrats in Georgia would have implemented shelter in place way sooner than the Republicans. So there's a, there's a no-win situation for the governor of Georgia here. Uh, Republican voters are punishing him for daring to shut the state down at all, and Democrat voters are punishing him for daring to open the the state at all. There, there's no grace in politics anymore, and Brian Kemp, I think, showed real leadership, uh, and people are savaging him. Now, he's got time to recover, uh, but obviously it, it's going to, to cause problems. Uh, David Ralston is stepping up and demanding a hate crimes piece of legislation. The, the man is such an opportunist try, trying to seize on this to look leaderly. Uh, he put out the first poll showing that the governor is is ruined and that Ralston smells like roses. Let me tell you what David Ralston is doing. There's a, a an election here in Georgia you need to pay attention to. Uh, seriously need to pay attention to this. Philip Singleton is a state representative in the Noonan Peachtree City area. He replaced David Stovers. David Stovers was a solid conservative uh, who stood up to the speaker. He had to to step down from the legislature because of family issues. And Philip Singleton is a combat veteran. He ran against uh, Marcy Sackerson, uh, who campaigns as Marcy Westmoreland Sackerson. She wants everyone to know that she is Lynn Westmoreland's daughter. Lynn Westmoreland was the congressman for that area for a while. Uh, she's got Drew Ferguson support. Drew Ferguson is the current congressman in the area. Uh, Sackerson, all of her money has come from out of the district except for $50, and almost all of her money has come from accounts tied to her family or her consultant. And the Speaker of the House wants Singleton gone. Why? Because Philip Singleton's entire campaign was an anti-corruption campaign where he lambasted the speaker for delaying criminal trials for, for criminal, uh, the criminally accused and denied justice for victims. 
and he said that was inappropriate and something needed to happen. And the speaker is is petty and thin skinned and has decided to use the money of the House Republican caucus to defeat a House Republican, it would appear. He he is holding a fundraiser for Marcy Sackerson, the speaker is. Now, this is important because if you're an incumbent member of the Georgia legislature right now, you're not allowed to raise money because the legislature has not formally adjourned. It's only in recess because of the virus situation. And because it's in recess, it's not formally adjourned, you can't raise money. So the Speaker of the House of Representatives is holding a fundraiser for Marcy Sackerson. The Speaker can't raise money for himself, but he's getting lobbyists to write Sackerson checks so that she can beat the anti-corruption candidate. If you are opposed to corruption, you should be opposed to Marcy Sackerson. Look at what is happening there. And this is a statewide issue. Frankly, I don't care where you are in the state. You should be demanding that your state representative stand up for Philip Singleton. You should demand that your state representative be vocal on this, that the Speaker of the House of Representatives is trying to beat a good conservative in the state legislature because that conservative believes the Speaker probably should no longer be Speaker. This is all about protection of his own power, which is why the speaker has come out for the hate crimes legislation. The speaker is trying to build a coalition of Democrats to keep himself in power. Uh, the man is never here. And by the way, I oppose hate crimes legislation. Just so you know, uh, hate crimes legislation is thought legislation. When you when you kill someone, it's because you hate them. I, I, hate crimes legislation is, is feel good liberalism up. Oh, Someone did something wrong. Now we're going to stick them with an additional charge because they hated the person. Well, that's why they did it in the first place. That's why the crimes are there. This is thought. Hate crimes are thought crimes. Uh, and we should not punish people's thoughts, whether we, we, we like them or not. You know, it is possible. It is possible to defend uh, Ahmad Arbery against the slander that is attacking by those defending his assailants. It is possible to say his assailant should go to jail for life for killing him and still be opposed to hate crimes legislation. But the speaker says now he wants it passed. He wants it done ASAP, and he wants no amendments to it, uh, where we're going to start criminalizing people's thoughts in the state of Georgia. Uh, and, you know, the, the left love this. Georgia is one of the few that doesn't have hate crimes legislation. We should do it. The only reason the speakers do it is political opportunism. He's had ample opportunity over the years to push hate crimes legislation, and he never did until now because he sees Brian Kemp's polling goes down, and he's trying to take advantage of it in the state. He's trying to use this opportunity of crisis in the state to to uh, ensure his power to throw out conservatives from the state legislature and put in big spending Republicans who owe their allegiance to the Speaker of the House who will not stand up to his own corruption. Lest you forget, the Speaker of the House monetized a law that he helped change so that criminal defendants could pay him thousands of dollars and ensure their cases would never, ever go to trial. One girl was 12 years old, molested by a preacher, and she's now uh, in her early 20s, and her case finally went to trial. And it took so long, they never even sent the assailant pastor to jail. They sent him back to Ohio with a slap on the wrist. That girl for years has dealt with the mental trauma of the situation, and it was the Speaker of the House who dragged it out for so long, that guy never had to go to jail. You should all be outraged by what the speaker has done over the last few years and the fact that he's now using the COVID-19 situation so that it, members of the state legislature can't raise money. And he's out there using his clout to raise money for someone who's campaigning against an incumbent Republican who is anti-corruption. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. You should demand that your state representative take a stand against the speaker on this. It is absolutely ridiculous that uh, they're turning a blind eye to him getting away with this. It just reeks of corruption, which is exactly what it is, exactly what it is. Uh, he's just a political opportunist. It, 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 you know, you, you wonder sometimes, you think Georgia's a Republican state. Why does it operate the way it does if it's a conservative state, if it's a Republican state? Because they keep putting people like the Speaker of the House in power. Now, I, I could go on a tirade about this all day, but but there's no reason to. Uh, there is a reason to talk for a moment about the budget mess we've got. This is not a good situation in the state. Uh, we have a massive budgetary shortfall, and it is all viral related. If you will recall, last month, Georgia had the lowest unemployment in the state's history. 
We had the lowest unemployment in the state's history. We had the highest number of people of every race and, and both genders. I, I only recognize two who were employed. And it all came crashing down because of this virus. State tax revenue is down. Sales tax revenue is down. Income tax revenue is going to be down. Across the board, the state is going to have hard times. It doesn't look like teachers are going to get the pay raise. The governor fought so hard against the Speaker of the House to give them. Because we don't have the money in the state right now. And so there are states who would like the federal government to step in and and give them money. The problem is that uh, the states who want the most money are states like California, Illinois, and New York that made terrible, terrible uh, pension deals. And now they want to be bailed out of their bad pension deals, and they want to claim that it's all virus-related. You know what this reminds me of? Back in in the early 2000s, after 9-11, the Republicans went off to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they paid for the war. We had the revenue to pay for the war. But they also went on a massive domestic policy spending binge with uh, No Child Left Behind, Medicare Part D, and the like. And none of that was paid for. And what the Republicans would do is they would say, what, you're you're, you're opposed to the spending? Why are you anti-American? We're in a war. And they would hide their big government spending behind the war effort. Even though the war was paid for, it was all the domestic spending that wasn't paid for. That's essentially what some of these uh, Democrats are doing around the country. It's essentially what they're doing. The, um, the, the, the whole idea is they've screwed up. They've made bad pension deals to fund a bunch of unions. They now don't have the money they expected to give to the unions that the unions would then redirect to getting Democrats elected. And now they want a federal bailout. There is no reason to give them a federal bailout for their bad deals. But – Objectively, it is true that states are now on hard times. The question is, where's the federal government getting this money from? Are, are they borrowing? Or are they just printing it? If they print it, they're going to devalue the currency. They're going to cause inflation. It's this is We are finally at a point where Republicans, again, are starting to speak up and say, hey, you know, this national debt thing, it's becoming a problem. Becoming? It's been a problem. You just haven't treated it that way. It's probably about time we figure out some fiscal sanity through this mess as we begin to reopen the country. You know, there's something to be said. Uh, for conservatism and rugged individualism right now. Uh, There is, when you think about it, every country, you know, it's amazing how for years the left has said the United, we're not nearly as good as other countries. Why aren't we more like Europe? And on and on and on. You don't hear that during this virus situation, do you? I mean, it's pretty striking. Uh, They've always wanted national health care like these European countries. They want more socialism like these European countries. They, they want all this this European nonsense, and it turns out the European countries are botching uh, the COVID-19 situation. The, the Belgians, you know, the Belgians are leading the death toll in, in, in the world, and, and the Belgians are out saying, well, it's because we're counting differently from everyone else in the world. Uh, the Netherlands is terrible because the Netherlands decided that they wanted to try herd immunity until it, it uh, started overwhelming hospitals and they had to shut things down. The British are in the same situation. The Germans are having a rebound. The Swedes, turns out, that the, like 12, 13 percent of, of cases in Sweden die. Uh, they try to keep it out of their nursing homes and failed spectacularly. It's, it's overwhelming old people in Sweden. Notice all the people who are pointing out uh, Sweden is the way we should go. They're not pointing out Sweden anymore because Sweden has turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. I say that with a, a heavy heart, given given my Swedish blood. It's not better in in Asia. It, it is not better in in Southeast Asia. It is not better in in African nations that are fighting the situation. Globally, the entire globe is having a trouble fighting this virus. And you used to hear "be more like Europe." Well, Europe is is worse than us. You don't hear even hear us be more like Canada. The Canadians haven't haven't figured this problem out. It, it is a failure of global leadership. But not really. You would think that people would look at this virus around the world and see that every nation has behaved remarkably similarly and every nation has had similar outcomes and think maybe there's something going on here. Maybe this virus is serious, but also maybe it's it's hard for government to to stop. There's, There's this story circulated today. 
the lost six weeks, the six weeks where America failed to contain the virus. Nobody was containing the virus. You know, there's a story out today in Ohio. It, it looks like this virus has actually been around a lot longer. Uh, in Ohio, it looks like the first cases from some antibody testing of late. In Ohio, it looks like the first cases were there in January. In Europe, it looks like the first cases were there in, in December. Now, I know some of you are saying, I know I had it in November, that still appears to be impossible. In fact, a number of the people who were being tested uh, on this hypothesis, their antibody tests are coming back, and it is explained by healthcare professionals as there have been a couple of really bad flu strains, and it appears that all those stories about a, a devastating flu season in December and January may have actually been the virus. We know that the earliest cases now in California were in January as well. It appears that, that COVID-19 came here in January and went to Europe in December and began to spread. And people assumed it was a really bad flu that just had not been picked up. Now we know it was something worse. And all those headlines about a terrible flu season turn out to have been about COVID-19. People were getting their flu vaccine and, and it didn't actually help them. Now I, I go through all that because I, I, I got to point this out. It turns out that maybe we should be responsible for ourselves. I, I, I know that that's a crazy idea, but I, I'm just thinking that it, it, everyone's looking for the government to save them. We actually, uh, there's polling out today that 63% of Americans want to shelter in place until there's a vaccine. I, I, my suspicion is people in theory want to shelter in place, but in reality, they really don't. And more and more people are venturing out. It, it's more and more crowded every day outside. Uh, Publix is more and more crowded. My local Publix, uh, fewer and fewer people I'm seeing wearing masks. Uh, it's I'm I just think that more and more people are ready to go back to normal, and that may cause the virus to rebound. There there actually may be a problem with the viral rebound, but maybe we owe it to ourselves to take some level of responsibility. I I know it's crazy. I I know it's crazy, but maybe rugged individualism actually works. Maybe the the leave me the hell alone brand of conservatism actually is something uh, worth pointing out. That government is not going to save you, and it doesn't matter whether Joe Biden is in charge or Hillary Clinton is in charge or Donald Trump is in charge. Uh, when you look at all of these countries around the world, and they've all had similar outcomes. It's really hard to say that Donald Trump singularly screwed up. I mean, honestly, it, it is hard to say that Donald Trump has screwed up when nationally his results and everyone else's results are largely the same. It just it boggles the mind. But the media wants to make it all about Donald Trump. Notice how they completely ignore Andrew Cuomo and the screw-ups in New York. They flat out ignore what happened in New York. It's all about Donald Trump. You know, the president is out there tweeting today, pointing out that the governors with, with high approval numbers, uh, he owes he's owed some credit for it because of all the ventilators and whatnot. The federal government got him. Maybe so, but the media is never going to give him that credit. Uh, and it's about time everyone figures it out that there was no navigating this crisis in a different way. You know, I, I got to tell you that. I, I'm continuing to dwell on the, the polling for Brian Kemp really is terrible. And less than 40% of the public supports the governor right now. And when you look into the data to see, it, it is Republicans are mad at him for, for closing the state and Democrats are mad at him for opening the state. There is a no-win situation there, which definitionally is leaderly. Uh, at some point, you've got to actually stake out claims for leadership, which he said he was doing. Uh, the upside for him is he's not on the ballot until 2022. If things go OK, I think he, he can have an I told you so moment. And it looks like he's going to be OK on this. But, man, uh, it is a reminder of a lack of grace out there in the public. Now, I, I got to I need to switch gears. And I want to focus on Dr. Fauci, who is testifying right now before counsel um, and e before counsel, e before Congress. I'm, I'm sorry. There's there's a Supreme Court Twitter thread in front of my eyes. Uh, they're, they're hearing the case about whether or not the president's bank records have to be handed over as I'm as I'm talking. Now, let me see if I can pull up. Is there any of the current clips I'm getting into the system? No, there's not. 
Uh, we'll get there as soon as these clips come up. Um, so Anthony Fauci is testifying before Congress, and he is expected to testify today, if, if the Democrats will shut up on the committee and actually let him talk, uh, that he's worried about reopening right now. He's he's deeply concerned that we're going to be in a situation where we can't reopen the country because of collateral deaths. Here's Jake Tapper from last night on CNN, and I got a comment on this one. And Gloria, um, as of right now, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, the head of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, and the head of the FDA, Dr. Stephen Hahn, they're all right now in some version of self-quarantine because of possible exposure to coronavirus at the White House, uh, and yet still President Trump refuses to follow the guidelines he's given to the rest of us. He doesn't wear a mask, he doesn't social distance. Why not set an example? Well, because that's not the example he wants to set. The example he wants to set, and I think we're going to hear a lot of that later this afternoon, is everything's fine. We're going back to normal. Uh, Things will be okay. He doesn't want to appear in a mask because he thinks that public will say, well, wait a minute, if you're in a mask, why are things okay? And I think the problem that the president has been having is that what's going on in the White House contradicts that very message. I mean, he's been tweeting over the weekend, for example, about how Democrats want to drag out the reopening because of politics. Well, lots of governors want to drag out the reopening because they want to do it in an orderly way so that they don't endanger uh, people's lives. But that is not the message. The message is get back to normal. We have to reopen the country and everything needs to look normal at the White House So you can know that it's normal in your community as well. Okay, but I mean, what about all the dead people? I mean, isn't well? That's right. Of course, you don't hear. You don't hear the pres. Yeah, you don't hear the president talking about that a lot, Jake. Do you? You don't. At the beginning of this, we heard the president talk about the terrible toll this has taken in the country for people who have gotten the virus and people who have died from the virus. But you're not hearing that a lot now. Okay. I, I, I gotta I gotta tell you, uh Glory and Jake are two of my favorite people in the media. Uh Glory is like a big sister to me. Um took me under her wing at, at CNN and I, I I don't necessarily disagree with her points on how she's characterizing the president. The president wants people to know everything's okay, so he doesn't want to wear a mask and, and she's right on that. But here here's the thing, and, and I get this from, from a lot of friends of mine in the media and a lot of other people who uh, how do I say this politely? We all have a paycheck coming in. There are a lot of people out there who don't have paychecks coming in. And they like to go back to work. And it's it's one thing to, to recognize we've got problems. But it is, it's just, it's, it's. I, at some point, we've got to recognize that we've got to balance out a virus and an economy. That we are, we're not dealing in an abstract or a vacuum with a virus. There's an e- economy out there, and it has people who need to go back to work. The government cannot just print money. The government cannot print money. Because if it prints money, it devalues the money in your pocket. Now, let, let me explain this in, in basic terms. And it's something that, that the left has, has begun disputing with, with funny math. So let's say that, it, okay, my, my, my friend across the street from me, has he's a doctor. He is, finds himself single and he's bought a McLaren. It's a beautiful car. And let's say the McLaren is $100,000. Tomorrow, let's say the government gives every single American $100,000. Just, you know, instead of this $1,200, every American is going to get $100,000. Fantastic, right? What do you think is going to happen to the price of the McLaren? Now that every American can go buy a McLaren, what do you think is going to happen to the price of the McLaren? It's going to go up in price because there is supply and demand at stake. Uh, There is way more of a supply of money 
there is way more of a demand for the McLaren and there's way less of a supply of the McLaren. The price is going to go up. So the $100,000 McLaren is suddenly going to be a million dollars or a million dollar McLaren will suddenly be uh, $10 million. The prices will go up. The, you give more and more Americans money by printing money. The, 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 the rate of inflation goes up because the, you devalue the currency. The more money that is in circulation, the less the money is worth. The Romans found this out the hard way. You know, this was back before they didn't even recognize inflation and deflation back then. What the Romans started doing is they were they were uh, providing coinage, typically silver coinage. And over time, they were having to, to print so many or make so many coins. They started adding cheaper metals to the silver. And they were demanding that people treat the impure silver coin at the same rate as the pure silver coin. And so people were treating it the same way, but they were raising their prices correspondingly because they weren't getting as much silver. And the Romans were transitioning from a currency based on metal to a currency based on coinage, but by and large, it was still based on this precious metal of which there was less per the coin. And even though they had to treat the coin the same, it wasn't the same, and so they were raising the money. Well, it, it, it's – it's slightly different now because we have fiat currency instead of currency backed by gold, which, by the way, I realize some of you are gold standard fans. I'm not. Uh, I think the fiat currency works just fine uh, the way it is. But, in fact, we had more economic destabilization historically when we had currency that was tied to the gold standard. But nonetheless, um, here's the problem. This is a situation where – if the government continues to print money and keep people at home and just pay them, the value of the overall currency is going to go down and prices are going to go up. And it's going to get to a point of economic ruin for this country, and I'm afraid we're closer to it than we think. And right now, China is pulling a lot of strings globally to ensure that, and everyone is ignoring the fact that we have to deal with China. We can't keep people at home. It is one thing to say, you know, we need to ramp up testing before we keep people home. But I, I just I feel like the goalposts are moving. Dr. Fauci is testifying before Congress right now. One of the things Dr. Fauci intends to say, if he hasn't said already, is that he's afraid we're going to see needless deaths by reopening the country right now, that we need to wait. That's all well and good for him to say he is going to continue to get a paycheck. We needed to shelter in place, and they told us, Dr. Fauci himself told us, we need to flatten the curve. We've got to flatten the curve to stop hospitals from being overwhelmed. That's what he said. That's what I told you guys. That's why we're doing it. In Georgia, there's this amazing – I just looked at the, the COVID-19 data for Georgia. Our rate of testing has gone up. Our number of estimated infections is is in the way of, of – uh, a estimated infection should be 4,801. And you know how many our confirmed infections are? 722. Now, we've only tested, I'm looking at, this is May 3rd. On Let me bring it out to, to uh, May 8th. On May 8th, the model suggested we could have anywhere between 2,538 infections and 9,794 infections. We actually confirmed 739 infections that day, and the daily test was 7,147. Now, if we had tested the entire population of the state, we certainly would have seen more cases. Maybe we would have seen 2,538. But it's notable that the cases have largely, on a daily basis, uh, have largely plateaued. Let me give you the numbers. On April 1st, the number of confirmed tests were 588. On April 7th, 809. On April 14th, 809. On April 21st, 815. On April 27th, 680. On May 1st, 738. On May 8th, 739. We don't really have a big bump in tests. The highest we ever had on a daily number based on this uh, IHME model was 859 confirmed cases on April 9th. Today, 720 cases. In fact, the other day we had the lowest number of daily tests uh, and, and uh, lowest number of hospitalizations. 
we've largely plateaued as a state. Now, more and more people are going out. You know, I was at Dickey Farms uh, on Saturday. Uh, Dickey Farms, it's a it's in Crawford County, uh, very, right right near where where Bibb, Monroe, uh, Crawford, Upson, all those counties are. Uh, Robert Dickey, he's in the state legislature. Great guy, uh, wonderful farm, great peaches over there. They've got a, a little farmer's market. You can go get uh, homemade fresh peach ice cream, soft serve. You can get vegetables, lots of produce over there. You can get peaches. You can get strawberries. You can get uh, – they've got strawberry fields where you can go pick them. It's, it's a wonderful setup over there, great people, and there was a massive crowd of people there this weekend. There were there was a line. We didn't actually stop. There was a line down the street to try to get in uh, just to get the vegetables and stuff, uh, and, and – uh, I saw a lot of people in masks. I saw a lot of people not masked. There were a lot of people who were uh, distanced from other people. There were a lot of people there clearly in, in crowds going together. People just want to get out of the house. The weather is beautiful. They want to get out of the house. And by the way, there is zero data out there that the virus spreads in public. Yesterday at the White House press conference, Jonathan Carl, uh, who heads the White House press corps, Jonathan Carl uh, passive aggressively tweeted about John Roberts of of – uh, of uh, Fox News not wearing a mask in the Rose Garden. Now, Roberts was seated more than six feet away from every other person at the press conference. When the press conference began, when the president walked out, Roberts put his mask on. There is literally zero evidence that the virus spreads in the outdoors. In fact, most of the data shows that the virus is, it's an indoor spread virus. It's not an outdoor spread. Uh, there are no known cases of the virus spreading outside. It, it's all indoor contact. And yet, Carl felt the need to shame John Roberts. You know, you, you want to go to outdoor places. You want to go to the park. You want to keep your distance from other crowds of people because it does make sense that if you're within six feet of a bunch of other people anywhere, you could potentially get the virus spread to you. But I totally understand at this point. The weather is beautiful. People want to be outside. There's a farmer's market that has fantastic ice cream. People wanted to go over there. Don't blame them at all. Most of the people were doing what they needed to do. They they were socially distancing. The people who work there were encouraging people to spread apart. When you got on into the – there's a a covered area where you can get the vegetables and stuff, and there were small clusters of people. No one standing around together. People were doing what they needed to do. Just be responsible when you go out. Be responsible when you go out. Is the virus going to spread? Yes, but we've always known the virus was going to spread. Might as well just go on out now. Live your life. Take the precautions you need. Wear a mask in public for the same reason you don't put your, your finger on the trigger when you're when you are got a loaded gun in your hand. Wear a mask. Keep the virus from spreading. Keep the, the bullet from discharging. Be responsible. But this whole idea now that we need to all shelter in place until we get a virus vaccine, uh, Fauci is saying we're not going to have one until next year at the earliest. We can't shelter in place forever. People need to work. People need to get out. Businesses need to reopen. Lives need to continue. Can we not be responsible in South Korea? South Korea is open back up. South Korea is being responsible. We're now testing more people per capita on a daily basis than South Korea. Can we not get people to wear masks and go back out in public? I, I don't see why not. We should frankly be giving credit to people like Brian Kemp for being willing to to have a go at it and see if we can find a responsible way to open back up. We should be doing that. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the program, is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. A number of y'all have uh, ordered Matt Moore's book, Serial Griller. I'm glad you did. If you want a link to order the book, interviewed him on Friday. His new cookbook has come out, and it's grilling. It's, it's not low and slow. It's it's high-heat grilling cookbook. Um, and if you want to see the Department of Public Health numbers as well, just text the word DATA to 33777. I would be remiss if I didn't note this hour is brought to you by dynamic money. Um, they are my financial planners. Uh, in, in fact, I'm, I've decided that, <laughs> so, you know, so Chris Burns, who's also my guest host, he is a friend uh, and, it, and it's his company. And I've just decided I got to have somebody else in the company uh, deal with my financial stuff because I always feel guilty when I'm hanging out with Chris, like, oh, can I talk about this with him or is he going to make me feel guilty for 
we're paying something. Is it in the budget? Um, but it's a great company that that helps you budget, helps teach your kids finance, uh, helps you with your 401k, helps you with your retirement planning. Uh, I really do recommend them. They really are ours. Uh, they were ours before uh, I started this program, and I'm delighted that they came on as an advertiser. Uh, and you, you hear Chris's updates. You hear him filling in for me. I, I think he's got himself some new radio equipment, so maybe I can have a guest host and, and take off a day here and there too. Um, but nonetheless, uh, dynamicmoney.com is the website. If you're looking for a financial planner, if you're looking for somebody to help you reprioritize your 401k, if you're looking for somebody to help you get out of debt, uh, if you're helping, looking for someone to help you restructure your your mortgage and things like that to be able to pay off debts, uh, talk to Chris and his team at Dynamic Money. Uh, they help Christy and me tremendously pay off credit card debts and a car payment and some other stuff. And and uh, it just, they just they've got all sorts of ideas, stuff I wouldn't have even thought of that they had, and and uh, dissuade, persuaded me not to do some of the things I thought I should do to take care of it. So good people, DynamicMoney.com is the website. Thanks to them for their sponsorship. That we got, man, I want to get into a lot of the good news in Georgia because there is so much good news out there right now in the state and the way things are headed. And I'm bothered for the governor. The governor is a friend of mine, and I'm a little bit bothered that uh, he he's doing so poorly in the polling for taking a leadership stand. And sometimes you pay the price, and he knows this, and he has mentioned this. He's going to have a press conference at 4 o'clock today to talk about next steps in, in what's opening. And I do suspect that as we see things go along, what we're going to see is him rebound because uh, he, um, he, he was a leader. And he got us out there and put us ahead of the pack, frankly, in reopening the state uh, and did so in a in a competent way. So the, the results will speak for themselves over time. If the virus does rebound tremendously, the irony is it's going to be because people didn't take the steps they needed to keep themselves safe, and he's going to get the blame for it. And I think he knows that as well. In the meantime, there's an attack out there today from the left-wing Intercept. The Intercept is the Bernie Sanders-supporting uh, website of, of socialist journalists. They They hate Republicans. And they love John Ossoff, and Ossoff's team has been pushing the story for a while, and they finally were able to get a left-wing socialist at The Intercept to, to pick up the story about David Perdue. It turns out uh, that before David Perdue was in the Senate, he was on the board of a, of a private company called Cartolytics, and he got, as, as a member of the board, he got stock options. And Purdue had some stock options that were coming due right before uh, he should have uh, gone into the Senate. They would not have been able to vest those when he got to the Senate. And so the board unanimously voted to allow the shares to vest about two weeks earlier than they should have. And now Purdue is being attacked for this. He was going to get the shares anyway. They sped it up for him by two weeks. The multiple members of the board have said that, in fact, they've never lobbied David Perdue. Uh, they've never come into contact with him. Uh, the bill that, that he's being attacked for supporting was a bill actually introduced by Tom Tillis of North Carolina and Kristen Sinema from Arizona and Gary Peters from Michigan. Uh, it's a regulatory relief bill that would help this company, but he's being attacked for this, and it's John Ossoff's team. It's amazing they've got to go that far back to before David Perdue was a senator, to find something to attack him on. Uh, meanwhile, the Doug Collins-Kelly Leffler race is getting very interesting. Collins is picking up just a ton of endorsements, including Karen Handel running in the 6th Congressional District, Drew Ferguson, the current congressman, and a number of sheriffs and others in the state. And I'm not exactly sure what Leffler is doing. We'll discuss when we come back. I want to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, uh, and that is Laurel Springs. You've probably heard of them, particularly given right now, you know, our kids uh, have very good teachers who've been hands on with them doing Zoom calls and stuff. Uh, but man, I've got a lot of friends of mine who they're in this quarantine shelter in place situation like we've been, uh, and their schools have not really done a lot. In fact, a lot of them have changed grades to pass fail or they haven't really been engaged. And uh, friends of mine feel like their kids might be slipping behind. Well, you know, maybe, maybe. Uh, you need to consider something like Laurel Springs if you're disappointed in your school right now, or maybe just for your kids, you need to optimize your kids' routine, make it more flexible for them, more dynamic for them, so they got more time to focus on things they love. Laurel Springs is an accredited online private school for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. 
Laurel Springs recognizes each child as a unique individual with their own personal interests, special talents, unique learning style. Their flexible learning program offers challenges and diverse elective courses. And Laurel Springs is accredited with the Western Association of Schools and Colleges and Advanced Ed, which means they got transcripts. They're recognized by colleges and universities. If you're interested in this, you can register your child at laurelsprings.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, today and receive a waived registration fee. That's laurelsprings.com slash Eric for your waived registration registration fee laurelsprings.com slash eric if you are interested in a new way to teach your kid you've gotten familiar with homeschooling over the quarantine it works but you need something with a little more engagement and a little more flexibility go check out laurel springs today at laurelsprings.com slash eric it is the third hour of the eric erickson show how are you i'm glad to be back on my feet today welcome thanks for hanging out with me i'll take your phone calls if you want for no that's the wrong number y'all one day i'm going to give you all my cell phone number and it's going to deeply embarrass me so many of you haven't already the phone number is 877-97-ERIC 877-973-7425. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. I, I, I want to give you the good news. I want to give you the good news. Um, It appears that Georgia really is on the decline of the virus. Uh, there are people, remember, the story here is so much about moving the goalposts because they told us that the the healthcare experts of America told us we needed a shelter in place to uh, change the curve to to flatten the curve to allow hospitals to stock up on uh, protective gear and ventilators and and hospital bed capacity and we've done all of that we've done everything they told us to do and and now suddenly we're not allowed to reopen the hospital, reopen the state. It, it seems just bizarre. It seems truly bizarre to me that uh, we we're in this situation where suddenly we're like, no, no, we, we said all of this, but we really can't do this. We, we really can't. We're just moving the goalposts. Um, y'all, I, I gotta, I, I gotta tell you the data is, on Brian Kemp's side, whether you or I like it or not. There's a poll out. CNN says 68% of Americans say a coronavirus vaccine is needed before returning to normal life. Uh, and, and before returning to normal life, yeah, certainly so. But we can return to life. We can return to life. The data is on the governor's side. Uh, Georgia, on a daily basis, has seen a decline in we're seeing an increase in total tests given and a decline in total positive tests. That's what we needed to do to reopen, and that's happening. Georgia is seeing a decline in the number of people in the hospital. In fact, we have the fewest number of people in the hospital uh, in the last month and a half. Right now, there are fewer people in hospitals because of COVID-19 uh, than, than we've had in the last month and a half, which is fantastic. We've seen a low death rate. We're seeing uh, ICU capacity. You know, here in, in Macon, where I am, we've got uh, Coliseum Hospitals, and you've got the Navicent, the, the Medical Center of Central Georgia. Navicent's a garbage name. Uh, the Medical Center of Central Georgia. And uh, the Coliseum Hospital has two hospital facilities here. There's Northside Hospital, and there is Colise- the main Coliseum Hospital. And, and they've largely wound down a lot of uh, uh, business at the Northside Hospital, including ICU space. And they've moved them all to Coliseum, which means that there are ICU beds there. There are hospital beds there that could be used if, if needed. Around the state, we've got capacity. The The situation down in southwest Georgia that was the hardest hit in the state per capita, uh, the Phoebe Caputney, they're beginning to recover. They're beginning to free up hospital beds. Things are going well in Georgia. What is necessary to keep them going well is for you and me to do the necessary things to keep the virus from spreading. Washing your hands, continuing to keep social distance, wear masks if you're in a large crowd. But if we do those things, we should still be able to go on with life. We won't have life as normal. You know what I want to do? I know it sounds serious. I know it sounds silly. But I want to be able to go sit with a friend at a bar and have a beer. I, I, there, there's no way I have to have a, a draft beer on tap at my house. Um, I know people who do there. There's no way I would do that. Um, but just, just to sit at a bar with a friend, have a drink and visit. 
uh, catch up with friends I haven't seen in a while. In fact, I, my, my buddy Ryan and I were supposed to get together last month, and we had, had an, uh, an appointment. We put it on our calendar. We were going to go uh, have a drink at a, at a local watering hole in Atlanta uh, that has good wings and just have wings and beer and hang out and enjoy each other's company because we hadn't seen each other in about four or five months. He's been busy. I've been busy. And we were just going to go catch up with life. And we hadn't been able to do that. And I want to do that. I want to go to Del Frisco's on Peachtree Street in Atlanta, which has Philly cheesesteak egg rolls, which are incredible. They are egg rolls stuffed with Philly cheesesteak. They're they're fantastic. Doesn't have the peppers and onions, just the meat and the cheese, and they're incredible. And they're they're they drizzled in hot sauce. I want to go have those. I'm ready for that life to come back. And if we keep doing what we're supposed to be doing, we will be headed in that direction. Some of these places won't reopen. Many of them will. But the data out there for Georgia is headed in the right direction. The governor led. He's getting blown up in the polls. People are mad at the governor for for being a leader. But that's the price of leadership at a time of crisis. But it worked. He was right. But we have a responsibility to do what we can do to keep the virus from spreading. Now, I want to go to the phones. Lori is calling from Macon. Lori, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you. <laughs> sure. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Sir. Um, I just had a, a question. Um, they said some, from the beginning that the mask only helped people that had the virus that people that did not have, it would not protect them, that it was to keep the coughing and the sneezing right. from the person that had the virus contained. But the people that didn't have the virus, the mask really wouldn't do any good because the virus is so tiny it would get through there. And my thing is, is this, um, you know, false security, wearing a mask all the time? You know, so I've had and, uh, some... And, and also in Macon, I see them wearing them on their lips, not on their nose. Yeah, I, I've seen it. Yeah, I, I saw that the other day. I was at the store in, in Macon, and someone had it, so it was covering yeah. their mouth but not their nose. Uh, so yeah, here's the I thing. Yeah, I saw one yesterday out, she had it on her chin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I kid you not, Lori, I, I kid you not. I saw a woman, uh, this has been now, I guess, two weeks ago, who was on Bass Road uh-huh. in Macon. She had an uh-huh. ice cream cone in one hand, a cell phone in her other hand, both hands on the steering wheel, and her mask pulled down below her chin so she could eat her ice cream cone. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, this woman's going to kill us all, not with the virus, with her bad driving. With the driving, correct, yes. Yeah. So, okay, um, so this is a great question, and, and thank you for it, because I've had this concern. Because if you recall, everyone, they said don't wear a mask. A mask is just if you're sick. So here's why they've changed that. Taiwan and South Korea decided to get masks for everyone. And the reason they did is this. You may have the virus or be a transmitter of the virus and never even know it, have no symptoms. In fact, an alarming number of people carry the virus with them and have no symptoms whatsoever. You will never get tested because you don't even know that you're getting people sick. And there are so many asymptomatic people with this virus who will never actually get it. Remember, originally they thought this is what got Brian Kemp in trouble. When he said he didn't know that asymptomatic people could spread it, it's not what he meant. Um, And I know this because he's been on this program and we've talked about it. The original presumption with COVID-19 was that if you were asymptomatic, that means you had no symptoms and you were transmitting the disease, eventually you would get symptoms. And now we know, I want to say it's like 50% of the people who get infected with COVID-19 never have a symptom. They don't even know they have it. They're like typhoid Mary. And they're spreading the virus to other people. They themselves are not getting the virus and, or they've got it and they don't even know it. They, they don't have any symptoms at all. No sign that they have the virus and they're spreading it to people. Because this is a problem, Taiwan and South Korea decided to mandate for everyone to wear a mask. And it has everything to do with you having the virus and not even knowing you have the virus and stopping you from spreading the virus. But it also does to some degree allow people to to mitigate Yes, the virus could, if, if you're coughing and whatnot, uh, the virus could come in, um, but also there are more and more signs that this actually does help, uh, wearing the mask helps. But you need to understand, I, I realize this is, this is bizarre given everything we've heard, but keep in mind, we are in May. We're five months into this. The Chinese lied about everything. So really we are four months into gathering all of the available knowledge we can. And we know from Singapore, 
and from Taiwan and from South Korea and from Germany and from Italy and from Turkey and even to some degree from Russia, although Russia has been trying to cover up all their data. We know that an alarming rate of people will get this virus and never even know it. And they serve solely for the purpose of transmitting it to other people. And so if you don't know you have the virus, you don't have any symptoms of the virus, and you're spreading the virus, uh, if you wear a mask, you can help stop a spread that you didn't even know you were contributing to. Uh, Remember the story of typhoid, Mary? I forget the the woman's uh, full name, but she was a carrier of typhoid. And she herself had no symptoms of typhoid, but she would come into contact with people and they would get typhoid from her. And she had to be uh, quarantined. And I I, want to say, don't hold me to this, but I think that for a significant part of her life, she had to be quarantined. And she had no symptoms. She was a perfectly healthy person, but yet she was a carrier of typhoid and was giving it to other people. And other people were getting sick and dying because of her. And that is the situation with this this COVID-19. It is something that in February and early March, when all the healthcare professionals were saying uh, only that healthy people don't have to wear a mask, they, they, they presumed that would be the case. The problem is that there are a lot of healthy people out there who carry the virus. And scientists to this day, we're in May now, have no idea why some people – Uh, have the virus and don't actually have any symptoms of it. And in fact, if you recall, all the data shows, if you're overweight, you have heart conditions or diabetes, you are more likely to suffer from this virus. There are overweight people with diabetes who are carrying this virus right now who have no symptoms at all. Uh, And and they have found some of them through testing. And they're spreading the virus, but they have no symptoms. So the only way to be sure to stop the virus spread is for everybody to wear a mask. Now, I will be honest with you. You may encounter me in some locations in Macon where I'm not wearing my mask. I've got one. I keep it in my car. Uh, a listener actually sent it to me. It's got a filter on the inside. It's cloth. It can be washed. Um, but there have been places I have it, and, and the reason I have it is because they're outside places or people are so spread out uh, that the odds of getting it are, are slim to none. So there are some places I've been going without the mask. For example, I went to Bass Pro yesterday. And I didn't wear a mask on the inside because everyone was so spread out of the store. You weren't coming into contact anywhere near anyone else. So I made sure to use hand sanitizer and and wash my hands and all, but I didn't wear a mask. I I didn't feel like I needed to, but I went to Publix the other day and and you're darn right. I wore a mask. There were so many people in the grocery store on Sunday. Uh, I wore a mask there and then went to Fresh Market. You got to wear a mask there. So I wore a mask there. But when I was vacuuming out my car at the car wash, they were keeping every other slot empty. I didn't feel the need to wear a mask there. Use your best judgment, but you should get one. And when you go to the grocery store in particular, when there are a lot of people there, you should probably wear one. If you're by yourself, you don't need to wear one. I, I'm I'm baffled by the people I've seen. Like there's a guy in my neighborhood and he wears a mask outside constantly now. And, and at first, the first time I saw him do it, he was mowing the grass. I thought, okay, he's wearing, wearing the mask because he's mowing his grass. But then I saw him outside doing other stuff, and every time I see him outside, he's wearing his mask. And it doesn't matter what he's doing outside. If he's going for a walk, if he's mowing his grass, if he's watering the yard, uh, I see him with the mask on. In fact, he stands in his yard with a – he doesn't have a sprinkler. He stands in the yard with a hose and waters his – I shouldn't be saying this. He's not listening to the program, I assure you. But nonetheless – yeah, I, I just say wear a mask uh, or at least have one with you and and have the sense to use it when you're in a crowded place. If if I, we didn't stop. So I went to Dickey Farms on Saturday, uh, which is near me, which is in middle Georgia, a big place. It's like if you if you go further south down towards Perry, there's lanes, which is very much in the same boat. Big peach crops, uh, farmer's market sort of set up. You can get homemade ice cream, things like that. Great setup. And. We didn't stop because there were so many people. There was a line to get in, but everyone was spread out. People had masks on. If I'd gone, I would have worn a mask. There were so many people. But then going to the car wash and I'm there vacuuming out my car, there's there's no reason. But this is the reason why. Yes, originally they said there was no reason for a healthy person to wear a mask. Now we know you can be a perfectly healthy person and transmit the virus and never even know it. And so out of an abundance of caution, they now want everybody to do it. It is Eric Erickson here. Y'all don't forget to go buy your Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce.
You should, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm still amazed. I, I had a lady actually email me yesterday. It was kind of funny. Uh, Roland Neal had uh, texted me and said, don't forget to mention Mrs. Griffins. And I, I was out sick yesterday, but uh, shortly thereafter, I got an email from a lady who wanted it for Mother's Day. Thank you for listening and for getting it, it for Mother's Day um, as, as part of your present. I can't wait to get my smoker here so I can use it on the wings I intend to. I, I've got wings that I'm brining. Uh, and I intend to put them on my rec tech. I'm very excited by this thing. Okay, w- but we have to move on. We do have to move on. Uh, I want to review, if you will, the Ahmed Arbery laws. Uh, what, 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 is, what is the law in Georgia as it relates to Ahmad Arbery? Because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And there is some really interesting stuff coming out about this shooting down in Brunswick. Uh, this is from Andrew Fleischman. He's a lawyer here in Georgia. And let me read you some of what he wrote. Uh, the standard for probable cause is whether a reasonable person could believe a crime has been committed. And it's relatively rare for officers to consider affirmative defenses. For instance, when a woman who had been raped and abused by her ex-husband for years called the police to escort him out, then shot him when he broke back in, she was arrested on the spot and convicted before she was finally exonerated in 2020. What officers knew when they arrived at the scene of Arbery's killing was that an unarmed man had been shot by two gunmen. The Glenn County Commissioner told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution the officers at the scene believed there was probable cause to arrest Travis McMichael, who shot Arbery, and his father, Greg McMichael. But that the local district attorney, who used to employ Greg McMichael as an investigator, told them not to do it. In an ordinary case, one would expect an immediate arrest. The long delay was unusual, and it was not prompted by a lack of probable cause. In the past few days, video of Arbery walking into a construction site before the killing has spread online, with some suggesting that it constituted either burglary or criminal trespass, but neither crime actually fits the conduct. Burglary requires entering property without authorization with the intent to commit a theft or felony. In an ordinary burglary case, intent is clear when the person steals something or commits further crime. Sometimes prosecutors prove intent by showing the person's behavior was otherwise suspicious. Here we have evidence Arbery entered without authorization, but no apparent evidence of unlawful intent. In fact, the homeowner has said uh, nothing was stolen, and, and a lot of people have been going in to look at the bill, just like Arbery did. The Georgia Court of Appeals has held that simply entering a building without authorization is insufficient to prove burglary without proof something was stolen. In the same case, the Georgia Court of Appeals made clear you can't be convicted of criminal trespass simply for entering someone else's property without permission. You have to enter the property with an unlawful purpose or have gotten notice not to be there. There was also not a lawful citizen's arrest. Gregory McMichael told police he and his son believed Arbery was responsible for burglaries in their neighborhood. But Georgia does not make it easy for citizens to go around arresting each other. Citizens are entitled to use reasonable force to arrest people who have committed crimes in their presence or immediate knowledge. And courts in Georgia have held that the two are synonymous. Here's the statute. This is what the law in Georgia actually says about citizen's arrest. A private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence or within his immediate knowledge. If the offense is a felony and the offender is escaping or attempt to escape, a private person may arrest him upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. The important point here is the unwritten point. You're allowed to make arrests as a private citizen in Georgia with only reasonable force. You cannot burn down an orphanage to catch one child snatching extra bowls of gruel. As the Supreme Court has held as a matter of law, you can't chase someone down with a weapon because you think they've committed burglary. For example, the Supreme Court of Georgia held there was no evidence of a citizen's arrest when a man with a baseball bat chased down someone who had burglarized his home. The McMichaels will have a hard time establishing a crime was committed within their presence or immediate knowledge, but even if they get past these series hurdles, they still are stuck justifying hemming an unarmed men, man in with a truck and guns when those acts are serious felonies under Georgia law. 
And then there's the issue of justification. You typically cannot raise it if you're the aggressor or if you provoke the use of force with the intent to use that force as an excuse. To use deadly force, the other person must pose a deadly risk. So the big issue with the defendant's case here is that they pointed guns at Arbery. We know this because, according to one district attorney memo, the first shot went through Arbery's hand as he was trying to grab the barrel. In Georgia, pointing a gun at someone is aggravated assault, even when you had no intent to intimidate them. The McMichaels will have to establish that they were in the middle of a lawful arrest when the assault began and that it will be difficult because they escalated for so quickly. Or they'll have to establish that they made a reasonable mistake of fact that led them to believe their actions were justified. But that's tricky because the response was far from ordinary. Or they will have to show that it was reasonable to point weapons at an unarmed man in an effort to get him to stop, a ruling you would probably not want extended to muggers. They have a very hard time justifying their behavior, and so many people are trying to justify their behavior for them. Don't waste your time, folks. They shouldn't have done what they did. Armand Arbery should still be alive. All right, y'all. We got to hurry up this clock. My smoker just arrived. <laughs> My gr- So the, they were supposed to call when they were 30 minutes away and, and say they'd be here in 30 minutes, and it, it crept up on them, and they called. And like 30 seconds left in the last segment, they called. So I had to call them back when I got in. And they, I told them who it was. They said, yeah, we just called. I said, I know. That's why I'm calling you back. They said, well, uh, we'll be there. And I said, we're going to be home. And they said, well, we'll be there in like five minutes. And they pulled up a minute later. <laughs> so <laughs> they just dropped it off. Now I got to go outside and put it together uh, after the show. But after the show, we, I, I won't jump into best of. I'll be here with you. I'll even take your phone calls. 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425 is the phone number. Uh, Mitch McConnell. It, well, hang on. Let, let me round up this point. There's there's one last thing here uh, in the Ahmed Arbery situation. Uh, let me read. I'm reading again, by the way. This is from Andrew Fleischman. He's writing at Art Digital. And let me read you this. This is important uh, because of the of the charges. Georgia, and I had forgot this. You know, I, I did criminal law for six years, but I did indigent criminal defense, meaning I never did capital cases. It was always, I mean, I don't know that I did anything other than drug possession, uh, drugs and selling drugs and things like that, hey, which is your typical indigent criminal defense stuff. He writes, Georgia does not have meaningful degrees for the murder of adults. If you intend to kill someone or if you're committing any felony at all when you kill them, it is capital murder. And that list of felonies includes, bizarrely enough, aggravated assault. That means that in any case where you have a weapon and the victim is aware of that weapon and the victim dies, you're guilty of murder. Malice murder is vestigial because in Georgia, prosecutors never need to prove intent to kill. And, of course, even where malice is an element, a jury is entitled to find that you intend to kill a person, uh, you shoot three times. They can infer that you intended the natural consequences of your actions. If you want to be clear that this felony murder workaround is it's kind of terrible. I often talk to jurors who believe that a defendant was not fully culpable for killing and think they have cut him a break by opting for felony murder rather than malice murder. Little do they know that it's a life sentence either way. Because the McMichaels pointed guns at the victim and the victim was aware of those guns, they committed aggravated assault. And because the victim died in the course of that felony, it's felony murder. There is also an argument for false imprisonment or aggravated battery as felony murder predicates, albeit weaker than for aggravated assault. But voluntary manslaughter is unlikely to be the result at trial because Georgia reserves that reduced charge exclusively for sudden, violent, or irresistible passion which frequently means a suspicion that someone's significant other is cheating on them, it would more accurately be called woman slaughter because that's the major purpose. For instance, when a defendant was shot in the leg and then killed and then killed his assailant, the Supreme Court of Georgia said he was not entitled to a voluntary manslaughter instruction because the provocation necessary to support a charge of voluntary manslaughter is markedly different from that which will support a self-defense claim. There are dozens more cases in the same direction helping to establish, for instance, that fighting prior to a homicide does not constitute this type of provocation that would warrant voluntary manslaughter. 
A cautious judge might charge the jury on voluntary manslaughter just to avoid having the issue on appeal. But typically, the fear that someone might grab a weapon that you're pointing at them is not enough for the reduction. If the trial court opts not to give the charge of voluntary manslaughter, that decision will almost certainly be upheld. Now, if someone suggests, pay attention to this because I've already seen this happen, and this is this is where I wanted to get to with this. If someone suggests second-degree murder, they have no clue about Georgia law. Georgia has a second-degree murder law, but it applies only to one thing, negligently killing children. A person commits the offense of murder in the second degree when, in the commission of cruelty to children in the second degree, he or she causes the death of another person being irrespective of malice. If you see any legal commentary, and I've already seen them, y'all, if you see any legal commentator mention second-degree murder, you should immediately disregard everything else they say about the case. In most other cases, too, anyone who Googles murder statute Georgia will have a better understanding of the law than whoever thinks second-degree murder is applicable. Georgia's Supreme Court Justice Blackwell once said, under the precedence of this court, most farmers and teachers, peace officers and preachers, lawyers and members of this court, as well as many members of the General Assembly would be felons, saved from prosecution only by the grace of a prosecuting attorney. Georgia's laws don't have meaningful degrees of murder. They don't require prosecutors to prove intent, and they allow the state to charge murder any time someone dies in a car accident. When they do mitigate murder, it's largely for reasons of sexual jealousy. Giving prosecutors this massive discretion over what is and is not murder is terrible public policy. It almost certainly guarantees that well-connected defendants will receive lesser charges and punishments for the same conduct than poor or minority defendants. We could and should change that. Because limitless discretion can all too easily be turned into limitless discrimination. But a good lawyer must describe the world as it is, not as they wish it to be. And the rules will never improve if we don't apply them to the connected and the powerful. That is from Andrew Fleischman. He is a lawyer here in Georgia writing about the laws in place with Ahmed Arbery. I have seen so much bad stuff written on this case. And I got to tell you all what's happened to me. Uh, from my monologue last week, so, so Philip, who works for me, uh, we'll take some of my monologues and cut them up, the audio of them, and put a post up at theresurgent.com where I'm the editor. Uh, particularly lately, I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to do a lot of writing over there. So he's been taking my monologues and, and packaging them. Well, one of them on Ahmed Arbery the other day went viral. And there were a ton of people who listened to it uh, where I was talking about the, the outrageous situation of the case, that uh, this young man should still be alive. And... We, I had someone called into the program and said uh, they have a hard time believing what happened had anything to do with race. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, they think if the roles were reversed, the same thing would have happened. And I said flat out, you, you're you got to be kidding yourself. If you believe two black men in Glenn County had killed a white man because they said they were trying to arrest him, you are kidding yourself if you think that those two black men would not have been in jail immediately. You're just, you're kidding yourself. You are deluding yourself. The fact of the matter is Mr. McMichael was able to get away with this as he did because as the local police said, the district attorney was his friend and instructed them not to arrest him. That is what the local police themselves are now saying, that the district attorney did not want charges pressed. He was willing to believe Mr. McMichael. Uh, we now know Mr. McMichael had uh, a run into Mr. Arbery in the past and was involved in a case where Mr. Arbery was arrested and his probation on, a, on something was, bro was, um, was taken away. We know that Mr. Arbery was no saint. But that still doesn't justify him being killed. And I, I just, I, I don't have time for the nonsense here. And so what happened, I said that last week, Philip put it up on the resurgent. It got spread around and I am now on a white nationalist email list. And since the weekend, I have been getting hate mail from white nationalists. Um, I am an inward lover. I am a Jewish C word. Uh, I, I need to, to pack my blankety blank and get out of Georgia. I am a discredit to my race. I am a race traitor. 
uh, all of these things for saying that this young man did not deserve to die. And now I, I'm the, the same people are sending me uh, edited clips as proof that these two gentlemen were defending themselves. I'm sorry, y'all. I am no rocket scientist. I am no doctor. And I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But when you are running down the road for any reason and two men pull a truck up to block your path and pull guns on you, you have every right to defend yourself, whether you are white or whether you are black. And if you throw a punch at someone who is pointing a gun at you, you may not should have done that, but you are trying to defend yourself. It is not self-defense then for the two people who pulled the gun on you to shoot and kill you. They started it, not you. We have an obligation to truth in this case. And the truth is Mr. Arbery had a history where he had done things he should not have done. And the truth is none of that has any bearing on whether he should be alive or dead. The truth is Mr. Arbery had done things in the past, making him no saint. He had a criminal record. And the truth is that had nothing to do with anything related to his death other than Mr. McMichael had encountered him in the past and presumed he was the same person uh, that was involved in a break-in previously. But that being said, Mr. Mr. McMichael had no arresting power, had no authority to arrest, and under the, the citizen's arrest laws in Georgia, he had no power to arrest Mr. Arbery. Yes, there is video of Mr. Arbery looking inside a construction site. The owner of the place being constructed said other people did it too. Nothing was taken. There's no evidence that Mr. Avery was planning a break-in of a house under construction or repair. He was just checking it out. There's a place up the street from me that was being built. I went in several times. I go out on walks after the show typically. Now that we've been in quarantine in particular, I've been going out on walks. And I've gone into the house several times to check it out. That does not mean that the someone not related to the homeowner had the right to gun me down because I went into a house that was under construction. And I'm baffled at the people who are trying to, you see, so there is, there's this thing run amok in society right now, contrarianism, that when everybody says A, you decide you need to say B. Because everyone else is saying A, so you're going to put all your chips on B, and 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 if you if you win jackpot, because everyone else is saying A, so you, all your chips are on B. So when you you say that you 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 double down on it, you put all your chips on it, and if you're right, well then you win the jackpot. More likely than not, though, you're just being contrarian. And there are a number of people, and it's almost a perfect single circle in the Venn diagram of COVID-19 truthers and Ahmed Arbery truthers. And it should concern a lot of you who consider yourselves conservative that a lot of the people who are doing this actually are on the right or purport to be on the right. It should bother you tremendously that the same people who believe that everyone's lying to you about COVID-19 also believe everyone's lying to you about Ahmed Arbery. And the truth is they're not lying. Some people aren't right. It doesn't mean they're lying. They may just not have all the information. They may be wrong about the information. They're not willfully lying to you in, in some cases, in most cases. But with this Arbery situation, why do you need to disparage a dead man? Why do you need to show that he wasn't a saint? I, I, I had this person on my Facebook page. In fact, I'll let, let me let me leave the person out of it in name. But it, it's worth it, it's worth reading you the comment. Let me read you what I wrote on my personal Facebook page. Um, it's really disappointing to see some people trying so hard to be contrarian that they've now found themselves trying to justify the murder of Ahmed Arbery. Whether he was in a construction site or not does not justify being gunned down. If Arbery lunged at a man pointing a gun at him, he was justified to try to defend himself. The bottom line is that the men had no business attempting a citizen's arrest when they were not the would-be victims of a crime nor had immediate knowledge of an immediate crime, which is the law in Georgia for a citizen's arrest. Ahmed Arbery would still be alive at those two men not pulled guns on him to throw out what about this or what about that does not change the situation it makes you a contrarian trying to justify a murder and you need to repent let me read you one of the comments i'll leave the person out of it maybe a listener i don't know so you're willing to make a judgment without knowing the whole story i'm willing to wait until the whole story is told to make my decision I'm more of the opinion that none of the participants are entirely in the right or entirely in the wrong. Bad decisions all around for sure to have led to the death of Arbery. Neither hot nor cold in this, just lukewarm. 
And a, a friend of mine challenged this person in, in the comments. And here's what I said. We do know these facts are confirmed, but we don't have to wait to make a judgment on these facts. The facts are citizens arrest laws in Georgia only apply when there's an immediate crime. And there was no immediate crime. Citizens arrest laws don't apply because there was no immediate crime. Therefore, the murder was completely avoidable, and Omar Arbery had the right to self-defense when they tried to stop him. Also, he didn't throw a punch until the first shot was fired. So you can sit back and say, well, I'm not going to make up my mind because I don't know all the facts. You're never going to know all of the facts. But if you can't make up your mind at this point, you're, you're being willful. You're being willful at trying to avoid the situation. And I, I just, y'all, I, I just, I think we, we should have a problem with that. As, as, as conservatives, we should have, a, we got an obligation to the truth. If you're a Christian, you got an obligation to the truth. You, you can't be Pontius Pilate saying, what is truth? Truth is in front of you. You got to make up your mind. And there are a whole lot of people in our post, our postmodern era, our post-truth era, and they all want to be Pontius Pilate. What is truth? Well, I, I'm an evangelical Christian. I, I believe that there is a God. I believe he's the creator of the universe, and, and I believe he is truth. He says he's truth. i got to believe him. So i got to believe that there's absolute truth out there. i got to believe moral relativism is a bunch of garbage. i got to believe that there is an absolute right and an absolute wrong in many situations, and it is an absolute wrong in the state of Georgia or anyone else for the mob to go on a killing spree. It is absolute wrong for any individual to decide they're going to bring justice. It is wrong. It is wrong in the Romans 13 sense. It is Rome in the, wrong in the real world sense. Uh, justice resides with the state, not with an individual who decides that he's going to go out and hunt some guy down and try to arrest him and then shoot and kill him when he can't arrest him. If you got to sit back and say, well, I'm not going to decide yet. I'm, I'm not going to make up my mind yet. Who am I to judge? You know, the very God who said, who are you to judge is the God who told you to judge. The, the very the very Jesus who in one part of the New Testament says, judge not lest ye be judged, and another part of the New Testament says you got to judge. In fact, in the, the judge not lest ye be judged, immediately thereafter says don't throw pearl before swine, which means you got to make a judgment call on whether or not you're wasting your time with someone. Is that, but I got to say, as an aside, maybe I need to do an entire monologue one day on what that actually means, the whole, whole uh, judge not lest you be judged. It is one of the most taken out of context sections of the New Testament and inevitably is done by pagans who try to pretend to be Christians who don't want to be judged on what they're doing. It has nothing to do with your discernment on whether someone is actually uh, making a right decision or not or, or living out their faith or not or misinterpreting Scripture or not. And you can't judge me. No, but I can say what you're doing is sin. Repent. That's what you're supposed to do. And those of you who are willfully trying to, to, to cast aspersions on Ahmed Arbery so that you don't have to say that what was hap what happened to him was wrong, well, you need to repent too. So I got to tell you guys, it, while, while we're here uh, and y'all are listening to me, and thank you very much for listening to me, and thank you for today's sponsors, Mrs. Griffin's Barbecue Sauce, First Liberty Building and Loan, and Dynamic Money. While, while we're all here chatting, the Supreme Court is having the argument on whether or not uh, the House of Representatives is entitled to the president's tax returns. And I got to tell you that things are not going well for the president right now. Uh, even, um, I mean, even Sam Alito questions the president's absolutist position on this. Uh, Neil Gorsuch is, uh, <laughs> Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, both appointed by the president, were not fans of the president's position. So what this case is about is, is you know, the, the state of New York wants the president's bank records for an investigation. He, the president is refusing to hand them over. And the House wants the president's tax returns and say that they want them because they want to shape future legislation regarding disclosures that are required uh, on campaigns. And uh, Gorsuch and the uh, Kavanaugh are deeply skeptical of the president's position. And Sam Alito wants to give deference to the president, but also thinks that the House representatives says they have a legitimate legislative purpose for requiring the records. And who are we to argue with the House of representatives saying they have legitimate purpose when the law is on their side? And 
it's not going well for the president right now. It, it looks actually really, really bad. Uh, in fact, uh, Gorsuch cut off the president's lawyer. They're, they're not supposed to be interrupting on the phone call. They're supposed to, the, the way these phone calls are working, you each have two minutes to make your opening statements, and then each judge gets, each justice gets two minutes to ask you questions. And Gorsuch asks the question of, um, why can't we defer to the House of Representatives on what it says it needs to develop the law? And the president's lawyer started to answer, and Gorsuch cut him off on the call and said, you're not answering my question. It's not going well for the president right now. My goodness. Um the president, I think his counsel suspected that they could get to the Supreme Court and, and he could be protected by the conservatives and the conservatives on the court are throwing the president under the bus on this position. Uh, Thomas is not asking questions, but all eyes were on Alito to see where the conservatives were because Alito is most likely to defend the president on this. And, and in oral arguments, Alito was rather brutal to the president's attorney. It's going to be very interesting to see how this shapes up. Man, so can, can, when we get out of here, I, I want to remind you at 4 o'clock today, Governor Kemp is going to have a press conference. I, I, I assume your local radio station where you're hearing me now may cover it. I, I don't know. Um, but I will talk about it tomorrow. I'm going to see if I can get the governor on for tomorrow, actually, uh, to talk about. Uh, the rumor is he's going to order that bars and nightclubs have to stay closed through the rest of this month. Um, as while we continue to get uh, the testing up to speed, he's concerned because there are reports from South Korea that the virus has started spreading again there and that they've been able to trace it to bars and nightclubs. And there's also in New York City, it appears that the virus spread in a number of bars and nightclubs there. So he wants to keep all that stuff closed down. So I'll bring it, bring you the latest tomorrow. Hopefully might be able to get the governor tomorrow. Uh, no guarantees on that though, but uh, one of the things is that the media continues to talk about the, the spike in cases around the country. There's been a spike in cases in Florida and Georgia, in Kansas, in New York, in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, y'all do understand that's because we're testing so many more people now. It has nothing to do with the virus all of a sudden spreading. It has to do with more cases uncovered. Do they not want those cases uncovered? We should be applauding them for uncovering the cases by ramping up testing as opposed to attacking them and making people scared as if the virus is spreading when it's not. The media is just so poorly behaved in this whole story.